Okay, we can uh, probably get started. And I'm not, I'm not going to read out of scripture again <laughs> this week. And um, what I want to do, this might be kind of uh, convoluted. Sometimes I'll say I'm not very prepared, and then it'll come out really well. Tonight I'll say I'm not prepared, and it won't come out very well, <laughs> most likely. And I, I don't want to preach this. I want to teach it. I want to be very careful about what I say. So it's a, it's a tricky subject. So lots of questions have come in about the prayer. And, um, and I thought I would just address it from a theological perspective tonight first. And then, uh, and then if people have follow-up questions, you should ask them by text or email or tell me. And then I will, I'll get to them. You know, either in a video or in a class or in person. So, um, well, the first thing I want to say, though, is that um, this new prayer thing that's going on with the group, I think, is really good. Um, I think it's a bit of a, maybe we found the center's main form of service, you know? I mean, you're going to spend a, a couple hours a day in prayer anyway, <coughs> and, and now you can spend some of that time with somebody else and hold them in that presence. And I think it's very powerful, and so many people are having quite profound experiences with it. And I think that's um, a, a flowering that's happening at the center. And then also people are talking about how they're feeling a sense of community they didn't feel before. So it's just wonderful, and I think it's really good. And if you're not participating in it, I hope you do. Um, it doesn't matter if you're not, no one cares. But there, there is just, you know, we pray. That's kind of our thing. We pray and meditate. So it would make sense that at some point that would become, just like it is with the monastics, a primary vocation. Right? That makes sense. That's what they're doing, holding the world in their prayers. And if they're, you know, if it's a healthy monastery and a healthy community, that means that the monks and nuns are variously hitting deeper and deeper stages of Christian spirituality. And if that's happening, then they're holding the world in variously deeper stages of spirituality. And that you, that you have to understand that really means something. And, and at the end of this, it, won't, it shouldn't be too long. It, it, it shouldn't be too long of a talk, but, but I want to be thorough. At the end of this talk, I want to talk about, maybe, maybe now, so think, let's start with this. So, so think about what prayer is, right? And so prayer is this connection that you make between you and God, right? And we know, like if someone says, hey, if you guys meditate, how come the scriptures don't talk about meditation? But we've all read theology. So we all know already the answer to that. We know that the answer is, they called it all prayer back then. But prayer could mean somebody drooling on their shirt, completely unconscious, having a vision. Prayer could mean someone on their knees, verbally saying something. Prayer could mean somebody meditating deeply on a scripture. Right? Prayer could mean someone in rapture. Right? Seeing blinding light. So these were all kinds of prayer. So when you hear, you know, the disciples were in prayer or Jesus rose early to go pray before, you know, before dawn to go pray, you only know that he was praying. You don't know what stage well, whoever they're talking about was in because the scriptures don't define that for us. So prayer is this way that, you know, we connect to God. And, you know, Jesus taught a very certain way to do it and it's with a personal God and there's all kinds of things about it that are unique. But, but we also know that it begins at the shallowest level of verbal prayer. And that's where you're saying something, right? And you're trying to say something true, you know? You're, isn't that right? When you're in there praying, you're trying to not lie. <laughs> You're trying to find something authentic you can say, right? That's true. And, and, and if you're inviting God's power to dwell in your life, you're certainly uh, 
you're certainly trying to mean that in a deep way. And we know that that prayer can then sometimes lead into a, a meditative state where you're thinking deeply about something to do with spirituality. And, you know, I, I planned this class for two days. Uh, this morning I spent, you know, three hours in prayer. And at some point in it, I was so deep in meditation that I wasn't aware of my body and I wasn't aware of the room, but I was in a realm of pure thought and I could just sit and hold all these principles and ideas in a world of pure thought with no awareness of the physical world at all. And that went on for like an hour. Where that's meditation, right? Where you're thinking deeply about spirituality. That doesn't mean you have to not be aware of your body, obviously. But so what I'm trying to say though is there's levels of depth, right? There's levels of depth. And this was nice because I wasn't even aware I was Clinton. It was just thinking of these principles. And there was no sense of the world. You know, we didn't even know that the world existed. It's very nice, detached place to think deeply about things. Very nice. But we know there's deeper stages than that because there's the contemplative stages where you stop holding ideas and intentions in mind. And you are just <laughs> dwelling in the presence of God. And Christianity says the quality of your prayer life before you get there some has maybe something to do with getting there and with the quality of there you get to. <laughs> right? So, so, so they're not saying just bag verbal prayer as soon as you can go deep. No one says that. The, the, this quality of sincerity or worship or devotion that we could find before we go into absorption affects the degree and quality of our absorption. And I know you guys know all this, but it's a review. Okay, so... Why should praying for someone else be any different? Why would, why would praying for another per person be any different than that exact same movement? So that means the first thing you're doing is trying to find a true thought. N not thinking you really can, for sure. But what are you praying for for that person? What are you asking for? It should be nothing. This is very difficult to say. Go ahead and pray for people. Pray for them. Try to pray for something true. How would you know? Well, you're in the spirit when you're praying. See if what you're asking for is just is a yes. In the power of the spirit. Like, just feel for that. I, I, I think of this Grateful Dead lyric, searchlight casting for thoughts in the clouds of delusion. <laughs> it's just, you just, I, I get in there and I'm trying to say something about this person that isn't a lie. I'm trying to ask for something to this person that even feels like it, it's even okay to say. Right? And, and, and I know, and, and some of this, by the way, I'm saying because other people have mentioned it. One, more than one person has said, Sometimes when I pray for a person, it feels like they really want help and all this power comes, and sometimes when I pray for a person, no power comes, or very little power. And, and they, the, more than one person has said, and that made me think maybe they didn't really want the help. And maybe they weren't the ones who asked for it. Maybe someone asked for them. You know, it, it doesn't matter. But there is this sort of correlation between how much power comes through you for somebody and how much they really want to be changed by that prayer. There is that. It's the, it's the way I know where people are spiritually. I know, because there's only a certain amount of power that comes through me. For some, with some people, it's a ton, and with some people, it's a trickle. That's how you know how open they are. Right? That's how you know. So you're trying to say something true. And, and, um, and I just want to be very conservative as a community in this one way. Um, 
If you got on YouTube tonight, okay, you could find entire churches praying for very specific politicians to win the election. You could find churches praying for certain political parties to win. <laughs> you can find people on their knees begging for Trump to win again, or Bush, or whatever. Um, you can find people praying for the end times to come, and they also envision a bloody war between Christians and sinners, where the sinners will be all rooted out, root, rooted out of the country, and murdered, well killed in the war. You can find Christian groups praying for that. Um, the, I read an entire book on this subject called American Fascism, and, and it's profound. And these are all Christians, and they're all praying, and they all feel good about what they're praying for. But certainly, something I've said, I try to name a bunch of options, certainly something I've said rubs you the wrong way that they're praying for. Maybe some of it doesn't, but maybe some of it does. The point is, they can't all be right, can they? So now, they're entering mild states of rapture and praying for specific outcomes. We call that sorcery. That's called sorcery. That's sorcery. When you enter into someone's soul, you probably shouldn't have any outcome whatsoever in mind when you pray for them. The, the de degree to which you can divorce outcome from your will uh, is maybe the degree to which you're actually doing God's will when you pray for somebody. So we want to make sure that we don't make that human mistake that humans make all through the centuries. Christianity should have cured it, and it, 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 we're popping right along with sorcery anyway. In all kinds of pockets, everywhere you look. And I would imagine if you were the mother of a child, it would be pretty darn hard not to ask for sorcery. You know <laughs> what I mean? Like I, I wouldn't blame someone if they're like, Clinton, you pray for God's will to be done, but I'm praying they get well. You know what I mean? And, and, and we know that we're asked to pray. I mean, we know that we're supposed to pray, but but it's very tricky in there. And the reason I'm saying be very careful is because, like, okay, just when I went into the night, not yet Christian, I'm surrounded by high-quality healers that the whole state knows about. I'm connected to all these various communities. You know, I've been for 10 years immersed in these, not just New Age communities, but alternative healing communities. Every single person I spoke to wanted to fix it. Everyone. They all wanted to fix the night. They wanted to end it for me because they saw it as a problem. And if I would have went to those healers, they would have been successful at stopping it from happening. Because everything that was, I was going through symptomatically looked like a problem to them because their theology is... is, is uh, not Christian theology. It's New Age or it's Buddhist or whatever the case may have been. I talked to a bunch of people from various traditions. They all wanted to fix it somehow. Make it better. And if it had gotten better, I would have never come to the other side of it. So, do you see how you might have to be careful when you're praying? Because you don't know, right? You just, we just don't know for sure what the outcome should be. And it's so tricky. I don't, it's, this is so tricky. There's no, there's no way to know in any instance what's right or wrong. That's why I mostly never ask for outcomes. I probably ask for an outcome once every 10 years of somebody. I just say God's will be done. I never say, let this happen when I do energy work on somebody. I always say, God's will be done alone and nothing else. <coughs> because I just, I'm not, I never know. I, I rarely, even if when I get a vision about somebody, I mean, we're all supposed to take that with a grain of salt, right? And I do. So I get a direct vision about what the outcome should be for somebody, and I still say, I don't know. So it's, see where it's a little tricky. We're trying to avoid sorcery. It took 
freaking three to five thousand years to get the Jews out of outright sorcery. Right? The Jewish pagans out of outright sorcery. Sacrificing children to get their will done. Grain offerings to get their, all these magic rites that developed around the Jewish tradition. Literal magic rites. You know, magical rites. Magical rituals to get self-will done. And all of that we have to grow out of. We have to grow out of it. So I just, we want to make sure that this community, and I don't think there's any sorcery going on, just so you know. I just, now that there's a massive vocation going on, we have to broach the subject. Check your will. Check your will. If you're in there thinking, yeah, man, I've got a healing gift. I'm going to make a difference here. Oh, that's a little spooky. That's not good. If you're in there saying, look, I, there's no way this is God's will for this person to be the way they are. Let's fix it. I think you're practicing sorcery. I think you are. You have to be very careful. And even with illness, it's tricky because we know from the, I mean, you've read, a lot of you guys have read the lives of the saints, a number of saints. You must have heard countless times that during specific trials in the spiritual life, illness comes with it. You must have read this hundreds of times. Should that illness be fixed? I don't know. I don't know. It's tricky. It, it depends. You know, maybe. I, mean, I don't know. I really don't know. But should it? I don't know. And you don't know either. You can't know. Because, you know, like when I was in the night, I got sick all the time. Just ridiculous. If someone coughed near me, I was getting it. it I, I never get a cold now. I'm going to now that I say, you know, of course. But I just don't get sick anymore. Almost never. But when I was in the night, if you sneezed around me, I caught it. It just was a way of it. I just knew I had great. They coughed, I'm going to be sick, and I would be. You know, just it's the way it was. Because in the night, they were killing me and hoping my ego died first. That's it. That's what they were doing. And this is my, I don't see it as trials. You know, some of the saints will talk about illness being trials on your faith, or I don't know about that. I, I, it could be. But I don't word it that way. I word it as they're doing chemotherapy on me. They're killing my ego, which is a cancer. And every other part of me is dying, too. And hopefully the cancer dies before I do. That's kind of how I came to view it. And there's no fixing that. That, that was the cure. And that's why everyone kept trying to fix it. I never let them. Because if I had let them, it wouldn't have gotten done. So, it's, so, so just, I want you guys to be, I don't think there's anyone, I don't have any intuitions. People are doing sorcery. I don't have any of that going on. But since we're doing so much prayer now, it's clearly a vocation. We need to make sure it is totally... And there's been miracles involved. There's been a lot of... It's not just this one recent. There's been a lot of stuff people have said where powerful things have happened in others' lives through this new vocation we've found. But let's be clean. Let's be clean. Let's don't be akin to those Christian groups that are praying for certain political outcomes. I mean, I know no one in here would do that, but you might do it with something else. If you're so sure you're right about something, you're casting your sorcery out on like a public debate. It's not our place to do that. That's not our place. So, okay, so just be careful with that. Be especially careful when praying for others in our group that you're divorced from outcomes. But then I just want to say the best way to be divorced from outcomes is to start without any and go into the void as soon as possible. <laughs> so like, how do you do that? So someone said, could we also have people do energy work on others? There should be no difference for us. Energy work and prayer are the same thing. There is no difference for us. They're the same thing. You hold that person in your consciousness. Some people say their hands get hot, mine do too. 
So I kind of sort of imagine my hands are on them. Because my hands get hot, so that's it. They're warm. So now I imagine my hands are on the person. If you're not, your hands don't get hot, that wouldn't be a useful thing for you. But that's what I do. My hands get warm, and I just imagine I'm holding them. And I'm praying. I'm mostly never saying, and if, you know, letting out come, come. I'm saying, this person is struggling with this. I'm saying, God, your will be done. I offer all this prayer for your will to come into the world. Your will be done, not mine. That might make them worse. <laughs> I don't know. But, you know, I don't, uh, Lauren's not here. Lauren comes in only when she can afford to get worse. Because every session makes her worse. Every session. For at least two weeks. And because there's more to do. And it brings it all up. So she won't, won't even come in unless, you know, it's like the right timing and then she comes in and it nails her for a couple weeks. That's God's will. That's God's will. We shouldn't try to fix that. Okay, so you have whatever intent you're holding and then just remember that, you know, then you can go deeper while you hold them in that intent. And if you are the kind of person that goes unconscious when you go into the deep, not everyone goes unconscious, but if you go unconscious when you go into the deep places, go unconscious holding that person. Don't let that be different. And I was going to read you a text, but it's already going on too long, so I won't, but um, Spencer sent me a text. He came in for energy work the other day, and he said, he experienced this. It, I hit the void. He could tell, probably because I snored a little. Sometimes I, sometimes I go <coughs> just a little bit when I'm doing energy work on people. And it's like, if, you, if it's you guys, I don't worry about it. But if it's, if it's people that don't know me, I'm just like, oh, come on, man. That's so <laughs> terrible. Because they're just going to think I'm sleeping. <laughs> but, but more than one person has said that they feel like I leave the room and Jesus comes in when that happens. Once I'm in the void, once I'm all the way gone, it's not even me doing the energy work. Certainly isn't at that point. I'm completely unconscious. But the results are better when I'm there than when I'm conscious. So my thing with when I'm praying for people is make sure I'm actually with them, make sure I'm actually connected to them legitimately through prayer, verbal prayer, and meditation. But I don't hold it there. I go all the way in. And if I come out and I don't feel done, I pray for them again until I go in again. But I'm doing my best just to get all the way out of the way so that my will's just divorced completely from the paradigm altogether. I'm not saying that's how it has to be for anyone. I'm just sharing with my experiences. The further away I am, the further I am into prayer, the better that energy work goes. Okay. Um, and then, and then just, I, I kind of went backwards. <laughs> that was the last page. Um, so I just want to say a couple more things. Uh, so one is, Christianity believes that sickness and death are not God's will. We, we have to start with that. The Christian paradigm teaches that sickness and death is not God's will. I think that's a radical thing to say. There, uh, after the night, that was there was a, a time when that seemed too much for me even to even hear. It just seemed like, come on, come on, no. But yes, indeed, um, the Christian paradigm starts with Adam and Eve, and they're not going to die, and they're not going to get sick. And God says, you can do anything you want in this garden, but of this one tree you shall not eat. Everyone wants to know what the tree is. <laughs> the truth is, the tree is irrelevant. The principle behind it is, it doesn't matter what the tree is. Everyone's always trying to figure it out. It's, it's, that's not the point. The point is that there are limits. God has set limits for humanity. And if you cross limits, whatever those limits are, you die. You die. Why would you die? Because, because until you cross those limits, until you go against God's will, you're fully living in God's life-giving power. You're fully inundated by God's life-giving energy. And you can't get sick. And you can't die. Because you are life. You are filled with life. That's the Christian paradigm. 
And then we go against that, we cut ourselves off from that power, and death enters the world. And it's cool, the mythology, like people live 900 years for a while, and they slowly go down until people are living three or 400 years, and then over time they're living, you know, 40 years is old, you know, in the Middle Ages, you know. <laughs> it's just crazy. And then now we got nutrition and stuff. We're living longer again, but it's, you know, getting up to like 90 or 100, 110, dying, but it used to be 900 because they were filled with God's life power. So Christianity says sickness and death are not God's will. But they, you guys, I, I know you've all read the Blue Theology book. This doesn't sound like a review. You haven't read it enough. The, not the Russian one, the, the Catholic one. Theology for beginners. We have to think with a Christian mind. Right? Christian theology. We think with Christian theology. We absorb it, we make it our own, and we see how to work it in this life. So, sickness and death are not God's will, but then there's, there's God's ultimate will. I don't remember the exact terms for this. And then there's God's conditional will. Right? So sickness and death entered the world. That's it. So now there's a big mess that it wasn't God's plan to have, but it happened. Now what do you do with it? Right? So now sickness and death are a part of the plan of salvation, even though ultimately they're not what God wants for humanity. And that's why I wouldn't say God causes a person to get sick in certain stages of spirituality, but that's why it's allowed. The fact is, certain egoic tendencies are shattered easily by physical illness. They just are. And if a person is feeling super vibrant, they're not going to die in that way if that's the way they die. Now, some saints don't get sick, so they didn't even need to get sick to get broken down. And Like, I'm not saying it's the only way or anything. But if you're a person that has to, be, to have a little bit of ill health in order to break through, you just basically need to have that. You need to have that or you're not going to break through. It's part of the way it happens in the lives of certain saints. We wouldn't want to pray that away if that was the case. We wouldn't want to fix it if that was the case. So you have to think of it like, Think of prayer like this, too. So we, we set aside time to pray for somebody, right? And then, I mean, you know, we're all just like not that enlightened, you know? So pr probably come out of some go at places sometimes to pray for somebody. <laughs> you know, it's a welcome reprieve even just to get in there and be praying for someone because you're not doing your thing you're doing. But imagine, see, that's like a practice. It's almost a trick. Prayer is almost a trick. Because the person that is enlightened, the person that is in complete union with God, would never, ever not be praying for others. It, it wouldn't be a practice, would it? It would be a permanent state of being. So that for the, the person that was enlightened to even look at someone, that gaze is a blessing, a profound blessing. To, for, for the person that is all the way awake to even think of another is prayer. So think of this prayer thing we found as a trick. It's a, a practice, a technique that puts us in a place that if we hadn't fallen from grace, we would all always be in. Now just for a moment, imagine what it does to the mountain every time everyone in the valley who is a Christed being looks at them. What does it do to the deer? What does it do to the tree? 
What does it do to whatever that person is thinking of or noticing? That's why Christianity says the earth is being transformed along with humanity. Because our vocation is to transform the planet through our consciousness. That's Adam and Eve's vocation, if you guys remember from the Russian theology book. Adam and Eve's vocation was to unite all of physical reality with God's love. To hold it all in God's love and make it one. So that humanity's role is to unite heaven and earth. We're to write the bridge right in the middle. Fully physical and fully spiritual beings. And to unite all physicality with the heavens. That's humanity's vocation. And so these little prayer instances we're having are glimpses into this. They're glimpses into this. Spencer asks, if God is already going to cure that person, what good did it do to pray for them? I asked him, who said God was going to cure that person? Who said that? If, imagine again that world where everyone's enlightened completely. And every gaze and every thought from every being is a profound blessing. And that means everyone is always blessing everyone and everything all the time. They're never not doing it. Do you think outcomes might be a little different in that, in that world? And imagine them, they're like at the level of Jesus, like where Mother Mary is, where she fully accepted his grace and salvation. So now imagine everyone is on fire in that way. Do you think that might change the way illnesses unfold in the world? I do. I think it would change the weather. I mean, I think it would change freaking everything in profound ways. So now imagine that's Adam and Eve. That's how kind of it was. Power flowing through them all the time. For them to look at a deer is a blessing on the deer. I think it goes the other way. Same with the deer towards people. I think everything's blessing everything. And it's on. And they weren't eating each other, by the way. They were vegetarians until we fell. So every, no one's like, I love you, but none of that. It's pure love, pure love going on. No one's killing anybody. And, and you know, and it's like, you're not getting the nutrients you don't need because you're filled with God, so it kind of doesn't matter. You know, it's a different world. It's not the world we live in now. It's a different world. But ima So imagine how much of God's power is pouring through everything and into everything. That life energy that's just going everywhere into everybody. And then sin enters the world. They hide from God. And just imagine that. Now, no, not God. I gotta hide, I'm doing bad stuff. And now is that gaze blessing the grass? No. No. It's not no longer. Now is that love felt towards another, caring with the life-giving power and wisdom and meaning? No, no longer. So we're living in this sort of diminished world where God's power can come through only in bits and pieces. We don't allow it in. We've made decisions not to allow it in for lots of reasons. Some to hide sin, some fear of to fear to be exposed and changed. And just look at your inventory, you know why. Right? You already know why. It's no mystery at all. 
And so we find ourselves in this diminished world with all kinds of bad stuff's happening all the time. God allows it, but is it God's will? Not everything bad that happens is God's will. So then, yes, if you pray for someone intensely, a miracle will come through that probably wouldn't have come through without you praying, probably. They probably weren't going to get well anyway. They probably got well because you took the time to focus your gaze upon them and God's life-giving energies poured upon that being and healed them. That's probably why, and they probably weren't going to get well if you didn't do it. I mean, you never know for sure, right? It's just, that's the thing, but I've seen enough miracles happen on the deathbed of somebody. I've just seen it happen enough times to know that it's happening because of the power that's coming through. So yeah, do your prayers make a difference? Yes. Should you pray for others? All the time. I mean, we're doing a great job. I love that we found, I didn't see this coming. Mm -hmm. This is a cool vocation, man. This is like, this is my job full time. I'm doing this all the time now. I've really been inspired by what has happened in the community. Just make sure I don't skip some really important things. Okay, last thing. Uh, a couple of people asked me about faith. Jesus says if you have faith, you can work miracles. So, um, you guys know because you've read the Russian book and you've read the, the one that's even kind of better for a foundation, the Theology for Beginners. You guys know faith doesn't mean belief. Right? You know that. Faith is a radical openness to God. It, 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 if you say faith is, I just believe, you, that's not faith at all. Um, and we know this. How do we know? Because, because people go insane all the time and believe that they have superpowers. If it was just belief, couldn't they just produce those fireballs? You know what I mean? Like, I worked with this kid that was kind of autistic, and he had three or four different diagnoses, and he really sometimes believed he had these powers. But he could never produce the fireball. Because it's not just belief. Right? <coughs> Faith isn't just belief. Faith is an openness to God. It's a radical openness to God. And the same with people on drugs, you know, the whole like psychedelic thing versus non-psychedelic stuff. I know lots of people who've levitated. I know lots of people who've worked serious miracles, um, curing diseases, in hospitals, on the ICU bed. Um, I've seen a ton of very powerful miracles play out right in front of me. Um, I don't know very many people who, while peaking on acid, cured people of diseases or levitated. In fact, I've never met a single one yet. I'm sure it happens once in a while. So what does that mean? Well, it, it means that just because someone gets into a very high mystical state and believes, doesn't mean they're really there and can do it. It means faith is this other thing. There's this other thing about faith. It's a, it's a, it's a, a, a profound openness to God on many levels. It's an orientation of one's life towards God. And there's false faith and there's true faith. And you can only learn what true faith means if you're listening to Jesus and your Christian theology and approaching it in that way. Or you can have this other kind of magic faith, which is sorcery, which isn't what we're talking about. I mean, that's not what we're talking about. So faith is less about belief than it is about openness to God's power. That's what it's more about. Openness to God's power. And it's an orientation of one's whole life towards God. So when Jesus says faith, he doesn't mean just believe really hard. You know the hours I spent trying to get stuff to move? I'm like, no, I can do it, man. Just move. <laughs> it would move, you know. I'm like, oh, I just, I know I believed it, but it didn't happen. But this was before the, this past, like, you know, even when I was 10 or 12, I'd try to move stuff, you know. And, and I was never able to move anything. 
even when I think I believe it. But it's because it's not just that. This openness to God, this radical openness to God, also opens yourself to power that is really there. It, there's an energy involved, right? There's a fuel that produces the action. Okay, and then this is definitely review, but just one more little thing about this. You ask in Jesus' name and it will be done. Okay, so so modern Christianity throws out the Desert Fathers, throws out the monks and nuns, throws out all solid Christian theologies, reads that and says, well, if you ask in his name, it'll be done. So you just start using his name like a magic, like a magic name, you know, like uh, this name has magic. If I say it in the name of Jesus, it should work. Well, yeah, sure, if you throw out all of Christian history, you can think that that's what that scripture means. But if you read the Desert Fathers and you read Christian theology and you read the lives of the saints, you know that Jesus meant in my name. <laughs> like you actually have to be in his name. And, and we all know that's a very different trick. That's a different trick entirely. In his will, in his power, and in his mindset, in his state of consciousness. When you're in his name, you ask for what he wants. Casting for the right thoughts. When you're in his name, you cast for the right thoughts. Sometimes I feel like I know I am. A lot of times I feel like I'm not, so I just say God's will be done. And find a burning in me that can, that can burn with passion for something I can't taste or see. You know, it's like I, sometimes I can find a deep passion for God's will to be done in someone's life, but I don't know what that something's going to be. Right, because I just because I sometimes feel like I really don't know at all. I just don't know. I mean, it, you know, psychology just came out of nowhere, right? Like there wasn't psychology, and then there was. Did you know that? Think about that. That blows my mind. I mean, to try to understand the lives of the saints without some help from psychology seems difficult sometimes to me. Well, what other disciplines have not yet just appeared? <laughs> Do you ever think about that? What else? I, I sometimes swear I can see them, but no details, but I, I sense them. I'll, I'll think this is a discipline we don't have yet. It's going to take the right person who has a bit of intuition, but also genius mind, to, to be able to really spot that and entice it out and start a whole new field of discipline. We don't know what it is yet. It, we're just barely walking around like little monkeys, right? We're missing so much. There are new sciences that we don't, we haven't invented them yet. If that's the case, right, I, I can't think I really know God's will for people. If there's whole disciplines I'm still missing, I must then be able to find a passion for God's will to be done in them. Because my little paradigm's too small. It's just too small. I mean, like, the saints talk about trials, and, and then you hear, you know, Keating talk about it, and he's talking about psychology. <laughs> he's talking about phobias, and he's talking about complexes. And, like, we know a lot more about what they were going through, not everything. Psychology can't explain it all. But we know a lot more about what they were actually going through now than they did in some ways. And then, okay, so... Um, But there is this power, but you guys, some of you are feeling it. There's this thing when you pray for others, this power that comes. That's service. 
I knew this group needed service, but I'm just so thick, I couldn't think of what it would be. <laughs> I thought we'd start a soup kitchen maybe, or I was like, what, we gotta have this service, these guys need to be able to serve, because I'm serving, all this power comes through, through me to serve you. Where's, you. where's your chance for that? It's prayer. There may be other things too, but it's prayer. You pray for others and this power comes through that you don't have access to on your own. You know, there's something about that. There's a great power in it. So now you've found a vehicle, not to tie it to something selfish, but you have found a vehicle for your spirituality to increase now. Because the whole time you're praying for someone else and they're pouring this power through you for them, you're participating in that power. And it's changing you too. And I know you guys are, you know, so many people are talking about how they're having, you know, not, I'm not trying to make you think they're seeing white lights and stuff, but just, it, it's meaningful. You can feel it. I would think, that if only one person was saying it, I think they're the ones healing everyone, but it's a lot of people saying it. You know? There's this thing that's real going on. That is, that will increase exponentially your spirituality. You know, a really powerful thing. And you know how, like, the Teresa of Avila, all Christianity says prayer is for, they'll say, read some hymns or read these scriptures or, or read the, like, court says he reads the words of the saints and it fires that desire for God in his heart. And, and, and he says he does better if he's doing that. And, and, and Christianity says, do that, do that, because then when you pray, you mean it more. And then God's like, right, you're asking, yes. Because it's always yes, but you just we can't always mean it. Yes, I want your love. You know, it, the, the, can you mean it when you say it? Is it a real request? Figure that out in prayer. Figure out how to mean it. Easy when it's someone you love. Close, you know, someone you're close to. Easy. But think of that that the intensity of that prayer life has something to do with the depth of your contemplation. You know, and I, I've shared this before, I don't share this stuff much, but my daughter had, we took her to uh, University of Utah opto eye doctor and she had a PhD and she I got my my daughter's eyes were terrible and and they, they gave it a diagnosis. I can't remember, I should look it up because it'd be worth knowing to say it more clearly to people, but it was bad, you know. They said she would probably go blind eventually. She had a serious problem with her vision. And I just, you know, I didn't throw up, but you know, I almost threw up. I feel like I was gonna throw up. It made me sick to my stomach. I, it's my daughter, right? She's still a baby and like three years old and, and you know the way I felt about my daughter at three years old was insane and I couldn't take it I couldn't take it so every freaking night for six months I'm in the heart of the night I'm dying inside I don't know anything about God's white light I don't even believe in it really at that moment it is so it feels so gone like it was another lifetime when I touched it but my daughter's eyes She's going to go blind. And I'm freaking out. And uh, every night I'm praying for like an hour, hour and a half, trying to find that light. And I was able to find it three or four times, and it cured that diagnosis. It went away. And it, we, she had still vision problems, but the kind that would get better. I asked the doctor, is it possible to misdiagnose this. He said, no, you can't confuse these two diagnoses. There's no way. It cured her diagnosis. It did. Sometimes I'd hit the light just for a moment and feel it shine into her. Plus every night just counted, you know, just trying. But then um, she still needed glasses. And I thought, well, let's keep going. <laughs> so let's do six more months of heartache of trying to get freaking out of this night that God stuck me in and 
tried to find a miracle for my daughter and, and I got a voice and it just said, it's not going to get better beyond this point. And it was an audible locution, which you never know for sure, but they're among the most accurate things you can get. And it just seemed right. It seemed like that was it. I wasn't going to budge after that, so I stopped. And started just doing energy work on her instead every night. The point is, it's, you can, it, it does, your state of consciousness sometimes does matter for how effective your prayer is. It does matter. And all of it matters. The intensity of the prayer, how much you mean it, and the depth to which you can get beyond yourself. If you missed any classes, you haven't heard this clearly. Um, people in the community are praying for people in the community, and it's having a profound effect. Just we, we've had a breakthrough. Um, something good. Probably just make a couple of announcements then. Um, one, one is a, a, a reminder. If you haven't read the Theology for Beginners, you need to read that. <laughs> and if you haven't read the Russian book, you need to read it. If everyone I thought had, and I now know lots of people have, so what, but read it. You, you almost shouldn't be walking this path without reading those books. You don't know it. I, I want to say apophaticism with prayer. If you have not absorbed that book, you don't know what I mean. Right? So like right now I want to say, when you pray for others, pray apophatically. Make some words. You don't know what those words mean. You don't know what, what the person needs. If you understand apophaticism from that Russian book, you know what I mean at a level you can't know it otherwise. Because that book transmits it to you. So check out, read those books. I know the Russian one is difficult. Um, so what? <laughs> so what? Read it. Uh, same with the Theology for Beginners. If you have not read that, and maybe, maybe, maybe just read it one more time if you haven't read it in a while, because those books are worth returning to. 